Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Ivan Shellam, whose name I'm completely murdering because it's Norwegian and weird as fuck, uh, is an experienced men's work facilitator, someone I like very much. Uh, he's found in something called Reclaim Your Inner Throne, which he's going to tell us all about. So um, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. So what's your story? How did you get interested in the body? In so many ways, my body is still my sort of final frontier of my exploration. And... Um, I will start with what is natural for me. You know, I was on this, I was on this spiritual quest throughout most of my twenties uh, after really having a life breakdown at around 2021. 20, and um, that breakdown I realized later had come from just a, just a full on repression of everything that was manly or masculine inside of me, like power and sexuality and all of these primal, you know, forces and um, I went on this mission for enlightenment that took me about seven or eight years of meditating. And, and that whole time, I wasn't really very focused on the body. You know, I, I obviously, I did meditation uh, practices that were a- around attuning to the subtle level of the body or the energy that not the, not the gross level of mastering how to be in the body and how to move and that kind of thing, but really more how to learn that there is a certain way that I can navigate my life through my body. I was starting to attune to that way of being in the world through that meditation practice. But really in terms of actually becoming secure in myself, it it didn't do anything much at all. So at at about uh, 28 years of age, I, I realized, okay, this is not working. I'm actually very confused. I'm still afraid of myself. I'm still afraid of my power and sexuality. And that was when I realized, actually, that what I had been looking for was a sense of masculine identity. And um, at that point, when that realization came, I became more interested in the body. And I, I, put, um, I put the meditation practice on, on the back burner for a little while, actually, and really went heavily into pursuing initiatory rites of passage around the world and really did my research so, well, that's how I came into it. And, and still, as I said, this is still my final frontier. It's, it's, it's where I have the most to learn. And yet, the way that I work is completely 100% somatic. I, I, when I am with a man, of course, I have my maps. I have my insights based on what I've seen. But more than anything, there is a way that I can use the body as a sort of, um, uh, what's it called, Douse, dowsing? Is that what's called? Dowsing rod? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Looking for water in the man, like the, the water off his soul, so to speak. The truth, and um, and so that's really my main way of using the body. And in terms of what you do, I have tons to learn from you. Okay, so I want to get into the kind of me to what you do because it's really interesting to me right now. So there's yeah. a few areas to go to here. So there's rites of passage you've already mentioned, which may be a new idea for some. Um, yes. And- well, then we also have, uh, I know you work a lot with archetypes as well. Very much. Yeah. So, so let's cover maybe those two as sort of two major areas of, of men's work generally and your own work specifically. Yeah. Where do you want me to start with that? The what's rite of passage? Rite of passage? Or... Like what's the rite of passage first? Yeah. Well, the rite of passage was uh, a ritual occasion in most ancient cultures, tribal culture, where... Uh, the boys of the tribe would in some way be taken perhaps away from the inner circle of the mothers and, uh, and the children and we would be most likely forcibly removed from the safe bosom of the feminine and taken by the men who often lived on the outer, in the outer circle of the tribe, somehow separated from the women. And so they would come and, and, and sometimes, you know, like a ritualistic fashion, just kind of steal these young kids, these young boys from the feminine. And there would be this whole play and the women would be fighting like, oh, no, no. And so there would be a bit of, um, there would be a, bit of a terrifying element to it, yeah. which is, well, in, in the field of psycho, uh, psychotherapy, some people talk about the, the phallic intrusion, and if anything, it's certainly that. It's when the masculine comes into the life of the boy. And really, as, as that happens, 
some some very important things start to um, recalibrate inside of the boy uh, as 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 he's taken by the elders, the men away from the feminine. He is scared. He is he realizes something is at stake all of a sudden, and this happens today as well, but in a different way. There's always a component of it, it's a bit scary. Something is really at stake, and 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 what what is at stake? Well, it's the the sense of being this youthful, self, um, self-possessed, very, very um, egoic, thinking that I am somehow very special. Perhaps my mother has been telling me I'm special since I was, you know, a little toddler. And and here comes the masculine saying, perhaps you're not so special after all. You need to be humble. You need to realize that the way that you are in the world is completely unfit for an adult life. And so there is a way then that these men will will humble this boy in a ritualistic way. And depending on the culture, it was it was tons of different ways. I'm sure you've seen the pictures of the boys jumping from the platforms in the jungle, having these wine vines um, tied mm-hmm. around his ankles. And in some cultures, he had to put put a hand inside of this sort of weird contraption that was full of killer bees or whatever, or, or ants. And so he would feel agony. But, but in the face of that agony, he would be also be given a vision that you're doing this for a vision. You're doing this because in some cosmic, um, some cosmic um, ha- narrative or, or an understanding of, of who you are, this matters you are being given some sort of a nutrition, uh, a secret of the masculine, and somehow it's connected to something that's frightening and that is in some way compromising my sense of safety and comfort. Yeah. And, and so, as, yeah. Let's take out some of the key elements here because this could sound like either some kind of, uh, uh, kind of tribal kind of exoticism or some kind of weird new agey thing. Yes. So what are the key things for just like normal guys in the normal regular world here? Like I'm hearing it's that basically, uh, women can't get you all the way to maturity. Definitely not. And you need some kind of a trial, some kind of, uh, a taking out of your comfort zone, a, a confrontation yes. with fear and intensity. Yes. But what are some of the key pieces here just for, the, for all of us, you know? Well, let's start with the beginning is that somehow this person, say you, the listener, are being taken away from the familiar comforts of your life. Yeah. And for a lot of people in the world today, that familiar comfort is becoming increasingly uncomfortable. Uh-huh. And, and there's a lot of people feeling really antsy about being in their day-to-day job because it doesn't seem meaningful anymore. But they're mm-hmm. also afraid of stepping out because it's scary out there. It's not comfortable because I'm not at the bosom of the mother anymore. I'm not having the safety of always knowing when I will be fed in a way. And so that's the first. I will be taken out of the uncomfortable uh, place. And then I will, I will essentially, I will uh, sort of receive or answer a call. I know somehow I'm being called to something greater. And some in our current um, cultural paradigm, this call is probably not a forced call. It's not like someone comes and grabs you and, and says, you have to do this. It will probably be more that you're, um, well, for me, right? I, I, was just, I was just realizing that something in the way that I was with myself was completely dysfunctional that I had to go on a journey of becoming a, a, a new version it's, it's of myself. Cool, kind of from the hero's journey model. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just want to name that. Um, it's probably implicit to you that the, the, that could be something like a subtle existential longing that modern life isn't quite right, or it could be yes. like a confrontation with a suicide or drug addiction. You know, you know, there's various forms from the kind of subtle call to the very intense ones. Yeah, definitely. And so you you go out on this journey, whether it is from any of the number of things that you just mentioned, like chronic illness, the death of a loved one, bankruptcy, a loss of a relationship, any number of things. There's just this this knock off, you know, destiny or whatever, or like a, a first maybe it's it's a sense that you're being whispered to, but with time it's like you're being hit in the head with a hammer. Uh, and so, and so that's when I, as an adventurer in life, I need to step into 
a new way of being in the world. And it could be to leave my job. It could be to leave my relationship. It could yeah. be to, it could be to enter a relationship. It could be any number of things, but it's definitely something different than what is currently. So in my own life, I had kind of an office job and it really wasn't working out for me and I was drinking too much. And then at some yeah. point I went, you know what, this is comfortable and the bills are being paid. I'm still suckling at the teat of uh, society in many yes. ways. And then exactly. I, and I, fuck it, I'm going to go do Aikido and I'm going to live in dojos and I'm going to be around men. It's going to be scary and intense and I'm going to get my black belt and I'm going to go for that kind of initiation. So, yeah. I mean, that, is that the kind of thing we're talking about here? Yes. That's yes. A good image. That's a good image. <laughs> and so, so people have the initiation period of some sort of intensity and that could have been in tribal societies, uh, ritualistic and, you know, there's men's groups who do kind of versions of this in the modern world. Yeah. And the uninitiated man is kind of a concept in men's work a lot as well, right? The sort of sort of grown child, like when I see 40-year-old businessmen getting drunk and trying to prove their manhood in the street. And I kind of think, yeah. what the fuck's that about? It's pathetic. So what is the uninitiated man? Like, what does that look like in the modern world? Well, it looks like most of us. And um, not necessarily saying that we're all pathetic, but there is a certain fire, a certain edge that is missing from pretty much every man alive in the world today. Mm. And um, while you mentioned something that you were circling at the tit still, and, and we have this idea in our culture that we live in the patriarchy, but you know, I think this is a very misleading idea. I think no. we live in a very feminized culture where, where most men are actually um, in the world in a very comfort seeking way there is no sense of warriorship warriorship or yeah. being out there on the frothy edges of evolution really giving myself fully it's it's not really main this is not the norm and and yet this is as far as i can tell what the masculine is all about and um and um can you can you bring me back to the original yeah, yeah. question I mean, let me I mean, there's something Having done a lot of martial arts, then worked yeah. in war zones, right, on the intensity of life, yes. there was something kind of pitiful about the average British bloke when I came home that I just looked to them and I, and for a while, the only guys I wanted to be around were kind of like firefighters or people working in serious psychiatric wards or people that were on the sharp end because it was like they were more real and more trustworthy. Yeah. It was like, okay, these, these guys are aware of their own capacity for darkness. They're aware of... Very good. And, and, and the sense of responsibility as well. Like they're not waiting for the handout. These are people who are... It's why I like entrepreneurs. It's like people who are actually fucking going out and hunting their own food, you know? Exactly. You mentioned being an entrepreneur and um, you and I are both entrepreneurs. So I now leave these trainings for men so that they can go mm -hmm. on the journey that I went on. And if there's one thing that I know is that being an entrepreneur and building my own business, that's a hero's journey. It really is because it's, you know, there's no guarantee. And again and again, you and I, I'm sure, have both faced the prospect of not having money to pay our bills. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I'm 10 years in and it was only, and it was only I say the first three years I was waking up and going, fuck, 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 how am I going to pay the rent, you know? Like right. next thing has to work. And I was waiting for the check to come in so I could pay the rent or eat, you know? Exactly. In the last few years, it's got comfortable. And there's something in that, don't you think, Mark, that as we are in that place where there is a kind of an existential dread, if you will, that, oh, fuck, I might end up not having a home by the end of the month, then somehow the, the, the idea of death becomes real. Yeah, I think it's, it's for me the the idea of jet death and reality of death and facing that in different ways is often part of initiations. And for me, it was literally, and for other people, it's more metaphorical. Because I think without that, you know, the cliche is true: it's difficult to live fully. Yeah. And there's something about being responsible of like not complaining. Like as an entrepreneur, it's like you stop fucking moaning because it's like put dinner on your own plate. Yeah. It's not. I'm waiting for that handout. Yeah, well, let me use this as a segue to my work with archetypes. Um, and if, if there's anything more to cover with rites of passage, let's just return to it. But um, well, I'm using a model of archetypes, which is very popular in the world of men's work. And it's a neo Jungian model devised by two and covered by two uh, American neo Jungians, uh, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so obviously this. Uh, 
obviously this idea of um, archetypes comes from come Jung initially, and um, in this in this particular map, it's been mapped out in the in a quadrated way. The the, the quadrated self, if you will, that the idea that somehow our psyche um, grows out of this quadrated archetypal self that has four qualities and each of these is an archetype and it's king warrior magician and lover or for women it's the queen right and so what i see is that uh, since we live in a feminized culture then there is this deadness this apathy this kind of comfort seeking uh, suckling at the tit attitude that is very common for men today and and it's sort of um uh, uh, a weak or dysfunctional version of what I call the lover archetype. It's, mm-hmm. it's comfort. It's maybe it's a certain kind of hedonism. It's drinking on the weekends, pursuing pleasure. And then I go into the work and it's kind of a shore and I don't really enjoy it, but I do it so that I can live for the rest of the time. And, and what happens if a man lives in such a way is that he, he you know, he, he tends to not really have the edge. He doesn't have a, a, a sense of death being a reality and he's not driven to or to pursue a greater version of himself because he's comfortable right yeah so this is this is where the warrior comes in and and i know that you've been doing a lot of work around this and and to really find that uncompromising commitment to my path and my vision and and to be willing to endure the difficulties and face the fears and and not moan about how difficult it is and so on and so forth, seeking support for by all means, but not being in this sort of oh you know I'm, why why me and this kind of thing and um, and so this is very important on the path I, I I I feel for a man to claim responsibility for my own destiny, if you will. Yeah, I mean, that that personal responsibility is the first thing I teach on any leadership course for men or women or anyone, because without that, the rest is impossible. Right. Uh, you know, I, I remember on a men's work thing I was on years ago, there was someone who was late, and the question they put to them was, what did you make more important than keeping this promise, i.e. I, to be on time? Yeah. And it was a brutal question, but it was also like, it really cut through the shit. And I was like, yeah, man, you know, at the end of the day, what did you? You know, we're all waiting around for you. What's going on? Yeah. Then my assistant course leader on Reclaim Your Throne training, Richard Arsic, he he always says this whenever someone is out of integrity. It's his go-to question. So I'm smiling. Yeah, let's talk about integrity a little bit because that, that is a kind of key concept in a lot of men's work, like, you know, honoring your word and that that being important, you know, and that's the yeah. other side of sort of making excuses. And I, I also think this is absolutely critical for just coordinating action over time and space. Like, you know, we're both on the call. We're both ready on time. You know, it's like I fucked up on the link and I first thing I did said, sorry, my bad. You know, like that, that's the only way to coordinate action and maintain integrous relationship. So it's, it's, yeah. this is a deeply practical thing we're talking about. Like, I won't work with anyone that doesn't have this pre-established as an ethic because I know they'll let me down and they'll have an excuse and then I can't fucking do the job. Yeah. So it's, 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 for me, this is like the most practical thing, not an abstract thing. Well, one of the most disconcerting ten trends of uh, modern contemporary society is that calling someone on being out of integrity is increasingly being seen as in some way, you know, abusive or... Exactly. Yeah, it's very bad. It's very bad because we're in, we're in the process of creating a culture that expects people to be children and not adults, and it's 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 very very problematic. Well, but yeah, across the board, this is certainly the millennial way of doing things. Is that my feelings are your responsibility, not my own? You know, you hurt me, you offended me. You know, I'm upset. You have to then change this attempt to sort of parentally control the world rather than to accept responsibility for oneself. Well, it's the consequence of a culture completely without initiation, right? Where 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 children grow up expecting to be mollycoddled all the time and expecting to get things for free and 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 so we never have this line in the sand saying, "Hey, hey son or hey daughter, I expect you to I expect you to be a man in the world now and and you need to carry your own load and and I saw just the other day that this 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 thirty um, year old guy in the U.S. had been his parents took him to court in order to kick him out of the house, you know, because they weren't able to do it otherwise. <laughs> but anyway, I want to return to the the question of integrity because I yeah. think this is this is um this is a concept 
that is a bit more complex than a lot of people paint it out to be. Okay. You know, the low level uh, version, which is absolutely, absolutely crucial of integrity is basically I'm true to my word. Okay. I'm going to be here at one o'clock. So I come at one o'clock. And if there's something that gets in the, in the way of that, then, um, then I tell you, and if, if I don't do that, then in some way I am not treating you or myself as a dignified adult human human being, right? And, and yeah, basic respect. Basic respect. We baseline, and then this idea. Returning to the archetypes, this idea of integrity is can be held in a pure warrior kind of way. It can become tyrannical, can't it? It's like. Okay, you're one minute late. Come on, fucking relax. You know? Yeah. Like, like, get your shit together, son. You're like 30 seconds late. What is this? Expect an apology. <laughs> yeah. You know, and um, well, what I've discovered lately um, a lot with my work is that so many of our challenges in life um, unfold along this axis of the warrior and the lover. And so if my way of dealing with integrity is completely stripped of any kind of attunement to the more sensitive side of me and others, and actually also having a, a level of spontaneity in my life. Yeah. Okay, so imagine, for instance, that I was walking down the street uh, 10, 10 to 1 uh, uh, on uh, uh, en route to my podcast appointment with you, and all of a sudden there was some guy, you know, lying on the street, yeah. gasping and, and yeah. bleeding. I was like, sorry, sorry, I'm, I need to be somewhere at one o'clock. You, you know, no, no, there's something more important all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah I, feel, I feel like um, keeping, you know, actually being able to renegotiate around priorities. But even that's with an integrity. It's like, hey, I'm late. And the reason is actually I did make this more important than being on time. And I'm okay with that, yes. you know, and, and, you know, has there been a consequence for you we need to deal with? So yes. I, I also, in terms of embodiment here, you know, our sort of central topic yeah. To just orientate around um, promises can be very cognitive and linguistic as opposed to tuning in to flow, the, the embodied lover, which is, you know, not fuck it, I'm going to do it, whatever. I'm going to do what it takes. That's the warrior, right? But yeah. the lover's like, you know what? I'm not feeling that right now. And I'm intuitively when I go with this and spontaneously there's this flow. Yeah. And I think to disconnect from that is to disconnect from one's own body and one's own source. And it I agree. become a very imposed cognitive thing to be too tight on this. And, and there's ever there's the, the balance between the two, right? Yeah. And don't you find that negotiating that balance is quite challenging at times? I do because it's I, I can easily my own bullshit can be in that you know yeah it's like you know what the flow is telling me to have a cup of coffee and turn up late and you know I'm just going to tell him and it's my don't, hey man you know don't fence me and there's that sort of um, new agey like uh, uh, kind of boy that doesn't want to have any sense of responsibility you know and then there's the sort of tyrant part that wants to control everything and you know be exactly on time and have everyone be on time for me so I can control the world. Yeah. There's some real traps there. Yeah. I remember a time in my life when upon meeting someone in person or on the phone, someone who had broken their commitment to, let's say, time, I, w I would meet this person from a state of a trigger. And then the first thing I would do would be to get it off my chest. And it would always create this really awkward yeah. situation. Yeah. Because because I, I I wasn't able to to hold it in myself in a way and and I had this very conceptual idea of integrity that no you know it's supposed yeah, yeah, yeah. so so I've learned this as a trainer if someone turns up late for a training they'll normally come in flustered and apologetic yes and that's not the time to talk to them about their integrity when they come out say you know what just it's all good it's good to have you here John sit in the back no worries we'll catch you up in the break and I just help them feel safe and relaxed at home. And then when they're set, settled, like in the next break, I'll come and talk to them and say, John, you know, it's really not cool that you came late. That's actually disruptive. Yeah. How, can we, how can we stop that happening again? Can I have your word? You know, and then he'll probably apologize sincerely and we'll say, okay, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. And then I'm not triggered and they're not flustered. And it just goes a lot better than if, you know, they walk in and I publicly humiliate them. What you're saying there to me is so important. It feels to be one of the keys of having functional human relationships that have integrity, but that also have empathy and understanding. Yeah. For me, that's tact. And that's something that doesn't come easily to me. It's not my, my, <laughs> my sort of go-to is the warrior. Like, Fuck you. I will fight you now. 
you know, and, and actually, you're ruining my class. <laughs> yeah. One thing the King and the magician bring is tact, right? Cause the King is like, I have dignity to deal with this at the appropriate time. Yeah. And the magician is like, what's the, tell me if I'm wrong here. Cause your understanding is deeper than mine. I'm just kind of reskilling myself on this stuff right now. Sure. The magician is like, what's the light touch that's going to make the most difference. Cause I don't want to waste my energy. Right. Is that a fair sort of sense of the integration? I guess the love is also just the, hey, the consideration for the fact that, you know, shit, shit happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with those definitions. Obviously, there's more to it than that, but that's, that's certainly part of it. Yeah. So if we look at the warrior and the lover, can you talk about the king and the magician then? Because the warrior lover acts is sort of basic yin-yang, fire, water in another model. Yeah. What, say, say more about um, the monarch and the, uh, and the magician. Yeah, well, I'd like to... I'd like to then bring in some of my new reflections and even revelations. It's been very exciting for me to conceptualize this new model that um, I call the master key. And the idea with that one is that, well, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette already uh, had the idea that there's a tension arc between the warrior and the lover and the, and the king and the, the sovereign and the magician. But, you know, what does that mean and so on and so forth. And so what I, what I realized with time is that most of the human drama, and you already mentioned the yang, yin, the posture collapse, the masculine, the feminine, the anger, the grief, the penetrate, the receive, so on and so forth, that unfolds along this spectrum of warrior lover. And then if we're really dysfunctional individuals, we will tend to completely identify with one of these sides and we will exile the other side into shadow. So meaning that I don't want to recognize that I have a lover inside of me or I don't want to recognize that I have a warrior inside of me. Mm -hmm. And then I become completely fragmented and I, I, I enter this game of total projection and condemnation of the parts of me that I don't like which is exactly what's happening in our culture right now as the, the right and left politically is being polarized. Yeah. Um, so where the magician and the, the king or the queen come in is that this is the vertical arc. Um, and um, imagine then, for instance, a pyramid where the warrior and the lover is sort of the foundation structure. And, and down below this pyramid, in, down in the, in, in the underworld, if you will, that's where the, the magician travels. You know, imagine Gandalf going into the mines of Moria with a fellowship and he has this staff with a, with a light at the end. And it's, you know, it's a metaphor for penetrating the mysteries of the unconscious of, of, of the soul. And whatever it is that I don't want to acknowledge, I've put down there more or less consciously. And so what I do then is that I go down there and I retrieve my shadow. I retrieve, say, for instance, you use the example that you more easily identify as a warrior, as a personality. Yeah. So then your, your tendency will be to uh, push your sensitivity and your empathy and your desire to flow and have beauty and so on and so forth. You will have more of a tendency to put, put that into the unconscious. Is that fair? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so then the magician's role is to actually say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm triggered by all of these people and I'm judging them and so on and so forth. That is the part in me that I have a proclivity to actually make an unconscious in my own life. Yeah. This is the shadow work as well, right? Like, oh, like yeah. looking at like, why am I always attracted to those really soft flowing vulnerable women? What's going on there? Or why do I love like sweet, innocent, little vulnerable kids? Yes, like, exactly. I love, I love kids. And like, it's part of that is very healthy. Another part of it is like, what's going on there? And it's like, okay, because you think you're a tough guy and you've, you've disowned your little inner kid. Well, you're outsourcing that part to others exactly. to hold, right? Actually outsourcing, those, you know, they get 50% extra free, right? Yeah, so I feel I feel like what we're attracted to and what we're triggered by, like they're the two kind of like, why do those particular people annoy me more than everyone else? You know, exactly. So it's kind of like a heaven and a hell that maybe you're attracted to this very flowing uh, feminine woman. And it's wonderful to begin with. But more increasingly, maybe you just get incredibly frustrated that she can't ever be true to her word and, and be on time or whatever. But that's another story back to the magician it's really um what often happens when a life um puts us on a path of initiation which tends to happen if we ignore the silent whisper long enough yeah yeah it will come and bite you on the ass oh yeah it will and for me 
what had happened was that I I got mononucleosis in the summer of 2012, and it just flattened me for pretty much five years. Yeah. And and I had very little energy, and it was very very terrifying to be an entrepreneur without energy. Mm. Um, but in in that process, I started to become conscious because you know my whole identity structure unraveled in the in the in the face of this incredible challenge, and so more and more I started to reclaim those parts that I had exiled, and and what what happens then back to this idea of the maybe there's a way for you to post an image of this uh, with a podcast I don't know but this vertical axis where the magician goes into the underworld and brings say the lover archetype back into your um, conscious identity structure mark Mm -hmm. then what tends to happen is that you start to to harmonize as an individual and you become less reactive to the parts of you that you don't like and as that happens more and more you start to reclaim your personal sovereignty and so this is this is the vertical axis. It's like this vertical axis of the magician and the king in you is harmonizing the conflict of the horizontal axis of the warrior and the lover. Yeah. And, and so by doing the shadow work, gradually the sort of the inner kingdom constellates inside of you and you become someone who is able to embrace <coughs> all people because you... <coughs> you no longer compartmentalize the world into people you like and you don't like because you have become a whole person. And now you can bless people and you can, you can challenge them in a loving way and you can tell them, you know, you're, you're wonderful, but there is so much more potential that lives in you. I would love to see you step into that. Yeah. So there's the functions of the king, right? So there's the, ble- you know, the, the blessing. The blessing element. I mean, that's a kind of a strange word in English. What's another way of putting that? Well, it's, shall we say, affirming your inherent goodness and potential. Yeah. Uh, so there's the kind of encouraging aspect, isn't there, of the king, but also kind of drawing out the grander self. Yes. The, the, the idea of having a vision, um, sort of a, a grand narrative for my life in which I, I don't know, maybe your listeners aren't uh, spiritual people, but there is with time and as i stabilize in who i am there is there is a sense of living for something that is greater than myself mm. Mm. and that is very much uh, the king or the queen and that mm. could be simply just being a parent uh-huh yeah i mean certainly running a company often has that feel i'm you know next week i'm leading a training and there's going to be a team there and I'm the kind of patriarch of that organization and there's something like bigger than myself that's being served there. Yeah, exactly. What does the body have to do with all this then? I mean, let's, let's bring as a sort of central theme of the podcast, let's, you know, obviously this is all embodied, but let's, let's bring that in. Yeah. Well, I will probably be speaking about that in a, in a somewhat different way to how other guests have been talking about it. Seeing as I come more from this um, magician rite of passage approach where for instance you have an embodied understanding over a long time that this job isn't for me anymore and you just know it it's somewhere in the body maybe waking up in the morning i feel stress or disgust or could be any number of things and so there's a there's an embodied knowing that i can choose to ignore because i somehow i choose to to say that that isn't you know real there's a lot of people who have a worldview which which is very rational that makes them filter out their body even if they're actually quite connected to it i've seen this and it's very strange um and so there is this embodied knowing that fuck it's time to yeah. go and and when i don't do this when i don't actually listen to my body listen to my just pervasive sense of stress and nervous system dysregulation. And it's just like everything is beta, uh, beta frequencies in the mind. So I'm constantly stressed. Clearly I'm not in the right place. Yeah. There's, I call that, I do a lot of purpose coaching with people. Yeah. Uh, that kind of purpose radar, the body is purpose radar. It tells you when things are right and you're on purpose. You know, yeah, I'm in the flow, I'm in the zone here. And then it tells you when, when things are fucking off. And I see people try and numb that out 
with increasing levels of addiction and distraction. Oh yeah. That's and what happens. Things, I'll, I'll say to people that are looking for purpose, I'll say, give up entertainment for a week, you know, stop fucking distracting yourself from that feeling yeah. of the body, you know? Yeah. This that's 100% aligned with my work. Okay. So the body's there as a kind of purpose radar. It's there to kind of tune us in to where we are on the hero's journey, you know, kind of if, if the call or when the call's shouting rather than whispering, when there's that rightness of sort of coming home to our work in the world. So it's there. And I guess for me as well, it's like these archetypes, we can shift between them. Like, you know, warrior has to me like a, an, an intensity of forwards movement. And sometimes yeah. for me, if I want to shift more into kind of lover mode, I just, soften my breath lean back open my hands a little bit and it's all of a sudden i'm able to access this slightly less habitual energy yes yes and i do believe that there is a somatic correlation between these archetypes and 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 the body say that say that the warrior is the thrust the penetration and the lover is more of the receptivity yeah then it seems to me that when my warrior comes really really online I feel my body from the the solar plexus down really like, mm, you know, there's a fire there. There's a, there's a fullness and, um, and it, it creates a sort of a, a grounding in my own purpose, in my own capacity to stand for what I believe in, in such a way that I don't mind fuck so much about what could go wrong and all of that stuff because I'm, I'm just like in the thrust, I'm in the uncompromising engagement with my life and I'm just yeah. doing it, you know? And, and when I'm, when I'm more in my lover, maybe, maybe I will feel more like flowing, as you say, more sensual, maybe my heart will open, maybe my sexual chakra will be charged and I will start to feel horny or seductive or whatever. And so there seems to be all of these ways that I can, I can, create the mind body connection or be aware of how my body is responding in any given moment to, to, to really become more intimate with what is actually occurring. Yeah. I think there's awareness and choice there, right? For me, it's like the beauty of talking archetypes can sound very abstract, like philosophical or psychological, but then it's like, Hey, try breathing this way, try standing this way, or, you know, as a practice over time, like, Hey, take up kendo, take up martial arts, or mm. Hey, you know, your practice is to walk in nature every day and look at the flowers, you know, like, like we can really give people the actual practices to work on. And yeah. that physical, like I know when my eyes narrow and my jaw tightens, it's like, okay, I might be going into more warrior mode than is helpful. Yes. <laughs> my, my jaw is almost constantly tight. So that's a good reminder. <laughs> so this is somatic science, but and let, let's talk about the sort of cultural body a bit maybe as well. Cause I mean, you're, well, I think our second guest from Norway, we've only okay. had a few Scandinavian guests on. We had one from a couple from Sweden. I mean, and there are, there are some particular kind of gendered stuff uh, in Scandinavia that I've come across. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'll gladly do that. I do want to uh, pre-frame that with saying that so much of my work and my understanding of the world is based on me being more of an international person. And mm. most of the people I work with are not Norwegians and my girlfriend is not Norwegian. Mm. And, and, you know, somehow I always felt a bit like a citizen of the world. So in some ways I'm not as attuned to what's happening in Norway as I could be. Um, but here's how it occurs to me is that we've taken this gender neutrality uh, experiment quite far or the gender equality uh, when people talk about where what parts of the world where this development has gone the furthest people yeah. often talk about Scandinavia and so it's easy to generalize and, and, and get into trouble with this but I would say that is very common uh, because I have some male coaching clients who are Norwegian, it's very mm. common for them to be living lives of compromise where they have just completely lost touch with who they are and what they want. And, and, and for whatever reason, there is some sort of a conflict with their partner or wife. Um, a lot of the time, quite frankly, what they report is that their wife is snagging them all the time and they just can't deal with it. So they just tune out and, you know, become nice boys or whatever. And, and, and so it's like the power balance is, is um, reversing a bit. So I, 
it's starting to become more common. I wouldn't say that this is like everywhere, but it's more common for for the woman to be the the man or yeah to be be the person with the pants on and who's who's in charge and making making the important decisions and so on and so forth and 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 maybe this wasn't intended maybe it was more supposed to be that we were supposed to be partners there but there seems to be something that when we go to this let's be partners place which is more coming from a sort of a politically correct maybe yeah. maybe even postmodern perspective there is something that is very um deadening it's it 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 puts a lid on the on the life force in the man he he starts losing himself and so um, it's painful to see but there's just so many men that i see in norway that they're just very very young emotionally and they're they're not really dedicated to to a life that i would consider manly or uh, like the the life of an adult man and uh, and maybe if he's a father it's 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 more likely that he's going to to live a life of responsibility yeah it brings me a certain level of grief and frust- grief and frustration when i really touch touch this reality that is so prevalent in the culture that i live in yeah i've certainly come across it in norway sweden north of the netherlands and it's not scandinavia but the similar kind of pattern in some ways of kind of women wearing the trousers and you know it's like the feminist cut the vikings balls off basically yeah uh, and I, I was i've been quite shocked by some of the stuff that i've seen and I, I see a lot of kind of weak boys and kind of tyrant mothers and i i get a very weird response from women in those countries they either want to kill me or fuck me like yeah. like wow yeah two ways or sometimes both at once and it's and it's because you know i'm sort of strongly holding unapologetically that kind of warrior energy and they just don't like it. Or and, they, they, and they do. <laughs> yeah. So it's like I get a funny response in those countries. And I, I, I have to be quite careful when I'm doing, say, corporate work for Ikea in Sweden or wow. you know, when I've done coaching work in Norway. And I've worked in Holland a lot. And, uh, you know, I remember doing a thing with archetypes in the Netherlands and all the women were loving it. They're standing there with their feet wider than their hips. You know, with Dutch women have this very wide stance. Like they sort of manage right. And they, they, they were, they're like, yeah, this is great. This kicks ass. You know, this is how you push out a baby. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm cool with that. And then they're, <laughs> they're like, I don't like it. You know, it feels, uh, this is my Dutch accent. If it feels, uh, you know, uh, violent and mean. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and I'm like, fucking grow a set. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So I, I, well, this I, is where I started out, you know, with my story at the beginning of my twenties yeah. where I didn't trust my masculinity. I didn't trust my power and sexuality. And it's, it is those primal fires, the id, as Freud would say, this 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 beastly part of us that has so fully been domesticated out of the male in large parts of the Western world. Yeah, and, and still the feminists are are standing on the barricades, uh, shouting, you know, the patriarchy is abusing us. But actually, for the most part, they're in charge now. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, so maybe the the top top level CEOs, executives, so on and so forth, are mo still male dominated, just because male are more masochistic and willing to give up all of their comforts for some sort of. Uh, <laughs> but it's sacrificing. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, men are men are just they're like work machines, like mad. You know, we, we don't care about you know enjoying our life on some level. So, but women seem to be more attuned to enjoyment for some reason. And I so we're, we're, you know, well, I was with a colleague today and she's equally talented in embodiment, equally experienced, but she's not as well known. And she said, you know, I, I couldn't do the workload that you do, Mark, I, the amount you put out there. You know, I told her I was recording podcast 130 today. She said, how have you done that? How, uh, in how many days has that happened? Uh, less than a year. That's fucking crazy, right? Yeah, I'm doing three today. So it's... <laughs> But that's like that warrior thing, you know, it's like, I'm going to run a marathon, I'm going to do that thing. And I'm not saying women aren't capable of great adversity, you know, handling great adversity and great, you know, doing things, but it's almost like self-abuse. That's the dark side of it. Like they're not as insane as you are, right? You know? Yeah. They're more sensible. They're more grounded. They're more fucking kind to themselves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, these are sexist generalizations, but fuck off. It's just look at experience, you know, look at who does the dangerous jobs in the world. You know, even yeah. what's funny in Scandinavia, where there's the most feminism anywhere in the world, 
is mm. that men still choose the masculine jobs, the most dangerous jobs. The women aren't lining up to be North Sea fishermen. I know. I know. I, apparently, uh, according, this is the, uh, the gender paradox that people talk about, is that we're more equal than anywhere else in the world. And apparently, our, you know, the way that we choose jobs is still or more gendered oh, than anywhere yeah. else in the world. Yep, more caring professions for women yeah. and more dangerous jobs for men. That, that's, uh, that's the data from the Scandinavian countries. Yeah, it's interesting. No one's forcing people into that. Yeah, yeah. So, there's so there are so many layers to this. It's very fascinating. And I do believe that we have fallen for this um, silly idea in Western culture that the world is somehow going to be safer if we remove masculinity from men. Well, um, men, men is dangerous, right? Men is, is you know, toxic masculinity, i.e. all masculinity is toxic, is really the kind of, is really what people want to say under that. Right. It's like men are dangerous and masculinity is bad. And if men were only like more women, the world would be a safer, nicer place. Right, which is why so many men, Mark, have completely disconnected from these more primal parts of their bodily experience. There is no energy in the solar plexus and the belly and the balls and cock anymore. Because the minute they go there, they're faced with the, the level of indoctrination that runs in them. And, and I speak here from experience, as I already mentioned twice. I was terrified of myself because yeah. on, on some level I had assimilated the idea that I was touching the very part of me that had created wars and genocide yeah. since the beginning yeah. of time. And it's such a crazy idea because it's this very same part of us that has protected families, that has sacrificed for the welfare of the nation, that has been going into the mines to, to put food on the, on the table of, for the family. It's like this... this level of insanity that is percolating in our culture now that makes this desire in men to serve the tribe, to serve the family, to serve the nation as inherently destructive and oppressive. It's sickening. It's very, very problematic. I think there's almost a sense of betrayal in it, you know, to frame things as the oppressive male patriarchy and all the men, I think of them, real men that I know that have been working their lives for their families. They've been working their absolutely to themselves to the death yeah put food on the table you know yeah and to tell and now them, you're the abuser you're an abuser and you're oppressive it's like no fuck right off that's an insult to yeah. iterations of men who have sacrificed and um yeah i don't think it's a on here's the, the reason that i think that no one really buys there's something quite shallow about this the kind of anti-man argument yeah uh, when i come here here's what you can say when I come to kind of almost anyone, whether she be hardcore feminist, indoctrinated into postmodernism at liberal university, or just a regular girl in the street, and I breathe and I look at her dead in the eye and say, do you really want to kill the wolf? And she feels that. And I'm like, this is, I'm, in, I'm in that energy now, like that part of me that's aware that I'm a killer, but is not going to use that to abuse anyone. Yeah. And I'm like, do you want this or do you want the safe guy yeah do you want the castrated guy like at that point i actually have some hope and i actually think most women still love men yes. so despite this weird culture around it and some of the weird narratives like the actual women i know they still love men yeah so i'm passionate about this i'm jumping in more than i normally would on a because uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a passionate topic for me well, it's a fun topic as well, and it's so alive. Yeah, it's. Oh, I, like, <laughs> I, I liked you slowing down. I just noticed how my how my mind has really been firing on all the neuron circuitry, but there is there is also a case to be made for just slowing down and coming from that place. Yes, there is hope, Mark. Uh, you know, in some ways, I wonder if if Scandinavia, the Netherlands, I I think there's a way in which masculinity is being reborn. And I think we're going through such a difficult stage at the moment where kind of men and women are almost at war. And I see young men being drawn to Jordan Peterson and, you know, this whole kind of movement that's there. And I, I actually see some light at the end of the tunnel now, though. I see some sense yeah. of reconciliation that at the very lead edge is like at the Integral Conference we were just at or... You know, I'm looking at some of the great, you know, I know if I was talking to some of the great women on your website, like Marissa, who you work with, or Annika, who, who I know, or Tess, like any of those women would be on our team. 
And they are like yeah. feminine, strong, intelligent, magnificent women, you know, like you, there's some serious babes on your website there. Like <laughs> I know those well, women. Like they are from the heart feminine and totally kick ass as well. When I look at women like that, I go, okay, that's a different thing than the closed down butch feminist. And all those women would probably call themselves feminists in one way or another, but it's a different model than the one I'm reacting to perhaps. Yeah. For me, it's such a delight with a mature woman that likes the feminine and likes the masculine and has, whether she ever was in, the war she has left that war behind and mm. wants to be on 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 my team on our team on the on the team of the men and this is my hope is that somehow growing numbers of men and women across the world can just chill the fuck out with all of these <laughs> destructive ideas and like hey we've been living together since you know the dawn of time and it's been kind of good like it's it's yes we've had our challenges But basically, it's better together than it is w with the war. And, uh, you know, being in men's work, I'm sometimes yeah. exposed to this resentful attitude that is coming from some women these days, where I see women in, in very unfiltered ways write in capital letters on social media that they hate men, period. Yeah. And, and all and, men are rapists, all men are violent. And, and I... You know, there is the part of me, probably the man part of me, that feels a little bit of pain with that. You know, mm. like, you know, seriously, can you can you acknowledge that there's something good about me, about us? Yeah. Uh, but but what I find, and I think what I'm about to say, I believe, is the challenge that we all are faced with right now, is that. If I take that one message and maybe it turns into two messages or three messages and that bit by bit, I start to take individual experiences and I connect them and I make it the collective truth, then I'm in trouble. I'm really in trouble because now it's, now I'm faced with this inconceivably huge uh, collective of people who don't like me and actually want yeah. to to hurt me. And so this is, this is, it's, it requires a kind of warrior discipline to notice, am I making the personal collective again? To not say women or men. To not say women. Okay. This one woman, she's saying that she hates all men. It doesn't mean that all women yeah. hate all men. And this is the trap that I see happening so much in, in this cultural polarization yeah. phase that we're in is people have a couple of experiences and they make it about the world. Yeah. And I must say, Mark, when I, sometimes when I challenge, um, sometimes when I challenge, which I don't know, like a moth to a flame, I, I know you're similar to this. Sometimes when I challenge these statements, the floor uh, drops out and there's no substance other than a few anecdotal stories. Yeah. Like once on a bus, a guy was sleazy to me and it was unpleasant. Okay. What a sleaze bag. I'll fucking, you know, what do you need? I'll help you out. Yeah. And how many times does this happen? Okay. Once on a bus. Okay. Got it. All yeah. right. So you've developed an opinion about all men from that. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't It's make sense. Very dangerous. And, and I noticed that part in myself as well. And I just, again and again, I just need to say, okay, this is not reliable let it go yeah yeah i've got a lot of hope but i meet you know some of the people like at the integral conference and i you know when i'm flirting and people are okay with that and, isn't that as good huh? you know, like, <laughs> and then they're just finding it funny and it's like okay cool we know that you you know you're not going to step across the line here and and this is all good you know it's 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 a different hashtag you know yeah It's like, oh, a better world is possible. Yeah. I, actually, there was an instance at the Integral Conference. This uh, girl from Ukraine uh, knew who I was. And, and she said, uh, let's do a selfie. And I said, yeah, cool. And I just picked her up. And I did this. And she's like giggling and laughing. And she hands her camera to her friend and says, take a picture, take a picture. And she takes the picture. And then afterwards, there happened to be this one sort of like bitter feminist girl that had seen it. She was like you didn't ask permission. She obviously didn't want you to do that. And I'm like, okay, that's not true. <laughs> and this woman was delighted. And we had a really fun time with it. 
And it yeah. was just a real juxtaposition of two worlds, you know, this world of like bitterness and anger and projection and this world of someone who was just in the play of it in the moment and was just having a really good time. Yeah. And that's, that's fun. I, I smile hearing your story. And I do like your capacity here. Let's go back to this archetypal man. Uh, your capacity to do that in a way that opens that woman and makes her have a great time is in some part your level of attunement to where she's at in your presence. Yeah. And so if you're not able to be empathetic in that way, you, you're not connected to the lover part of you, then yes, men will tend to be more abusive than they should be because they're, they're, they're not connected. And, and, and so that is, that is why I think it's so important for a guy to just, okay, relax and make, get a massage make make love slowly have a wine you know and then and just okay life is all right man it's just quite good to be alive and and as an expression of my delight in being alive i now lift you up and celebrate the man woman dynamics in this moment mm. Mm. nice so we we need to be moving towards a wrap up here are there any kind of topics that we haven't touched upon that you're you know feeling strongly about right now I'm sure we could speak for hours, but uh, um, I do. I do feel we've had a good and frenzied tour of some quite complex topics. <laughs> I want to point listeners to a couple of really good dialogues that happened on the podcast. Uh, one is with Anita Teresa, who's an American. Uh, I guess she'd probably call herself a kind of feminist embodiment person. We had a really good dialogue, but with a, a lot less agreement than we've had today. Ah. Uh, a real genuine listening. And I, I love that episode because an example of what's often missing in the world today of disagreement, but with respect and humor. So I want to point listeners to that one. And also Lim, uh, Lynn Holmquist, who's a Swedish tantra person who has a very um another perspective on some of this gender stuff and the embodiment of that as a tantra person uh, the episode yeah. with her is really juicy and gorgeous and I, i just want to hold her up as just a really kind of um mature woman who loves men uh, without being naive about some of these topics so if people want a kind of balancing female perspective i, I, I tune into those two yeah okay party things curious about that <laughs> tell us a little bit about your course um okay the reclaim the inner throne and where people can find out about that yeah by now uh reclaim the inner throne has become a body of work more than just a training but yes our main training is a three-month online journey so we don't meet physically and yet there's a lot of embodiment there's a lot typically men will become incredibly or much more intimate with their bodies and their somatic experience. Um, they can, a man can find out more information about this on inner-throne.com. And also would like to say that if the guy that would want to do this is the guy that knows that something more is possible. And he's been on that verge of some sort of, um, I don't know, maybe a breakthrough or feeling, feeling that ripe potentiality for a long time, but isn't quite able to break through into the next mm -hmm. layer. This is a guy like that can come on this three month journey and we'll take him deep into his, into his addictions and his shadows and all of the stuff that he's been running away from for a lifetime. And then we will through a, a powerful magician journey, we will, integrate the warrior and the lover inside of him and then end with a reclamation of his sovereignty and reclamation of his, his inner throne. So that is all on inner-throne.com um, slash, slash initiation. But we also have, uh, now we have um, breakthrough process. It's a new archetypal constellation work modality that tends to take men and women into a very, very powerful Uh, transformational territory where we can we can basically recalibrate tons of these inner conflicts within the span of an, an hour i was just in antwerp last weekend and it's just amazing to see what can happen in just an hour uh yeah and we have retreats uh, uh, this july 3rd to the 8th of july we have this amazing men's retreat in the norwegian mountains which i would love for men on your podcast to join us in and i also do coaching so there's 
yeah, well, there's any number of options from more low level investment to the full three month package. So just go on that URL that I provided and it's all there. Great. I'll put that link up uh, when we share this, of course. (sighs) Okay. Good stuff, man. Final message about the body to part with. Trust it. It's telling you things about your life that are crucial and, and your body is smarter than your strategic mind. So start to listen and start to navigate your life through this somatic experience. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Subscribe to get more. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which helps with our rankings. So really appreciate that. Um, Equally, if you want to support the podcast even more, then fund us. Um, Go to Patreon. Give us a dollar per episode. Um, Those who don't know, Patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world. I know like so much is available for free now. And, you know, what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it. You know, Maud and I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, And if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. And of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.